Amen. Let's go before God in prayer. Dear Heavenly Father, we thank you for allowing us to be here today. Thank you for your grace and mercy, health and strength that you've bestowed upon us. We recognize that it is through you and for you we have been created. And dear Heavenly Father, we thank you and give you all the glory, the praise, and Holy Spirit have your way in us today and forevermore. In Jesus' name, amen. Let me move this out the way. I'm going to stand up and walk around for a little bit. I know we haven't been doing, able to do that for a while, but I got to be me. I got to be me on this one today, amen? amen. All right. So, um, I love to purchase flowers. I used to love purchasing flowers for my wife. Most of us men like to purchase flowers for our wives, amen? And we purchase them because, well, one, it's tradition for us to purchase flowers for Valentine's Day, Mother's Day, some sort of appreciation. Just say, I love you, right? That's why we purchase flowers. Now, a few years back, my wife told me just to stop purchasing flowers because she kills them. She don't know how to take care of flowers. Roses would die within a few days. Um, I shouldn't say a few days, maybe hours in some cases, all right? Because no, I love my wife. But no, she would honestly say, say, hey, don't purchase flowers for me anymore because I don't know how to maintain them and develop them. So I was heartbroken at first. I'll admit, I was. I was a little heartbroken at first. But I got over that because I realized that if it's not something that, if I'm buying her a gift and she doesn't use it appropriately, why continue to buy it? When she said, you know what, listen, I don't want to have that responsibility. That's not like me. So I said, okay, fine. So I honored that. I honored that. I honored that. Now, at my house, I have a garden. I have a garden at my house. And this year we're planted, we planted tomatoes, green beans, uh, cabbage, broccoli. Like I take the broccoli down. I didn't do a good job with that this year. I don't know what it is. It looks like a tall weed in my garden right now. I have no idea how to grow broccoli. So if somebody knows how to grow broccoli, please help me out. Help a brother out. But so I grew this. And before we put the seeds in the ground, my family, we all get out there and we till the ground and we weed the ground. And then we put the good soil down and then we sow the seeds. And that's about the extent of what my family has to deal with it because I got to go out, <laughs> I got to go weed it, I got to prune it, I got to maintain it. Amen? So uh, this year, like I said, it's been a challenging gardening year for me at least because the garden hasn't been acting the way, even though we got a lot of rain, my garden has been, hasn't been as fruitful as I like for it to be. But nonetheless, we're still getting some produce and things in there. So some of you guys, y'all know that you all get some tomatoes and green beans from me. I'm expecting to see some of that this year as well. But this year, my wife decided that she wanted to do a plant. She wanted to make her own little house plant. So she got two little pots, put some plants in it, and started to grow them. And before she went away to Disney, she said, um, yeah, because my kids went to Disney. They left me here in Indy while they went to Disney. Isn't that just great? That's a loving family, amen? No, I had school starting, so I couldn't go. But they went away to Disney. And when she goes away to Disney, she says, hey, babe, can you... Um, water my plants for me and make sure they continue to grow because they were starting to seed. I was like, okay, not a problem, not a problem. So she goes away to Disney and while she's away at Disney, Shavonda, can you show that picture? The, the, uh, the slides, the, the plant, oh, all right. So while she goes away to Disney, I take a picture of her and send it to her. And so this is what the plants look like. You can see it's nice, beautiful plants, right? Starting to grow out of the, plot, out of the pot. Beautiful plants, beautiful plants. And you can also see that they're starting to overcrowd that pot. So she needs to get a bigger pot. So she came back from Disney. She's like, oh my gosh, I'm so excited. My plants are doing so well. And I need to put them in a bigger pot. So I said, OK, hey, babe, there's a bowl over here that you can use to put it into. It's a big bowl, probably like about that big that you could put them into because it's about three times that size. And going to have them grow, continue to grow. She says, OK, well, I need your help with this. I was like, OK, great, not a problem, not a problem. Well, a day goes by, she doesn't plant, transplant them. And she's like, okay, well, I don't know if I'm gonna do it. I'm like, okay, she's like, I'm like, I don't know why you're not doing it. She's like, well, I, I'm, I'm not certain of it. I said, okay. So she goes out to run some errands. So I go ahead, I take the plant out carefully, cause you know, you got the roots that are growing all over because this is now, as you all saw that plant, it's taking up the entire pot. So now the roots are starting to attach themselves to the edge of the pot. So you gotta be careful when you're taking it out and you gotta transplant it into good soil. So I do that, and then she comes back a day or so later and says, oh my gosh, my plants are dying. Sure enough, she's right. The plants were dying. 
So I had taken the time to help her. She's like, oh my gosh, this is something that I wanted to do, that I was doing for myself, and I didn't really need your help with it because I wanted to see how I can make this thing grow. So I didn't know that piece of communication. So I rushed out to the store, go get a bigger pot, go get her soil, because I'm feeling bad. My wife communicated to me that now this is something that she wanted to do, and here I am, I'm hindering her progress. And here these plants are, they're dying. So what I go ahead and do is I go ahead and water the plants, water the plants, knowing that they can be, that some of them may come back to life. Okay. So I water the plants, and we're waiting, we're waiting, we're waiting, days go by. The plants just continue to wilt, continue to wilt, and continue to wilt. And I'm like, man, my heart is getting sad because I am damaging something that my wife was looking forward to. So I started praying. I was like, Lord, help me, please. I'm like, and this plants, you know, if you keep, take care of plants, they get enough sunlight, they get enough water, they can simply grow back, right? We'll come back to that later. So now, today we're going to talk about his story, history, his story. The word history, H-I-S-T-O-R-Y, by definition, means the study of the past. Amen? But when I looked at the word history, I saw his story. And to me, that meant how can I or how do I fit into his story? So when you look at throughout all of history, it's honestly about his story. How you, 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 and all of you, and including me, fit into his story, the story of Jesus Christ. And when you look from Genesis to Revelation, you constantly see the same thing. They are foretelling or talking about how we as a human being, human race, fit into the story of Jesus Christ. Amen? So on Tuesday night in Bible study, one of the scriptures that we talked about was Ecclesiastes 12, 13 and 14. And that says, now all has been heard. Here is the, here is the conclusion of the matter. Fear God and keep his commandments. For this is the duty of all mankind. For God will bring every deed into judgment, including every hidden thing, whether it is good or evil. Now, this is the NIV version, NIV version of Ecclesiastes 12 and 13. Now, the author of this passage is believed to be King Solomon, the wisest man that ever lived. Now, his father was King David. His father was King David. Now, what I thought was rather unique was that throughout the entire book of Ecclesiastes, we see Solomon constantly analyzing different things around human life. Now, Solomon was a wise man, and Solomon experienced a lot of stuff. I mean, when you look at Ecclesiastes and when you study what Solomon did and didn't do, there's not much in this world that he did not do. He did not do. So in his entire book, he practically explores every aspect of life, including life and death, health and sickness, wealth and poverty. And he, he concluded the book of Ecclesiastes with those verses that focus on two things, fear God and keep his commandments. Because if you study the book of Ecclesiastes, you see that Solomon says everything else in life is hevel, hevel. H-E-V-E-L. Nothing but smoke. It just vanishes. As soon as you get it, it just vanishes. Your life, it just vanishes. That's all it is. It's hevel, smoke. So he, he concluded that. But yet, he said there's two commandments that you need to do. And this is the Old Testament, mind you. Fear God and keep his commandments. The wisest man in the world concluded that. Now, if we think about it, we fast forward some 2,000 years later. Who said the exact same thing? our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Love the Lord your God with all your heart and treat others as you treat yourself. Fear God and keep his commandments. So it's funny how even in the Old Testament, they understood how they were a part of his story. Amen? So not only should we fear God, and now when he says fear God, it does not mean fear like be scared, be trembling. It's to give reverence to, to show a major or utmost appreciation for. 
That's what the word fear means. To give reverence to or to give high regard for. So that's what he says we should do. And you know what? Where did Solomon learn this from? As I stated earlier, King David was his father. So David experienced a lot of things in his life. David experienced so much stuff that he was considered to be a man after God's own heart. So if David was a man of, after God's own heart, his children must have seen the work that God had done in his life. So Solomon, being the wise person that he was, even as a child, he said, you know what, listen, I'm going to look at what dad is doing. And God encouraged him to do so. Encouraged him to do so. So David, in Psalms 110 and 1, says, The Lord said to my Lord, Sit in the place of honor at my right hand until I humble your enemies, making them a footstool under your feet. So David even acknowledged or had a vision or prophecy that God was this all-powerful being. And God even gave Jesus the authority because God said to Jesus, listen, I'm going to take care of this for you. Your enemies will be your footstool. Amen? Amen. So now, we're going to fast forward 3,000 years from David and Solomon all the way to about where we are now. Roughly about 3,000 years. We're seeing the exact same thing. We are living a part of his story. Amen? Now, in Hebrews 11, Hebrews 11, verses 1 and 2, it says, Now faith is the confidence, and this is also the NIV version, now, faith is the confidence in what we hope for and assurance about what we do not see. This is what the ancients were commended for. The ancients referring to the people in the Old Testament. They had a belief that they were going to do the things, that they were doing the things so that they would be able to get to heaven. That's what their belief was. That's what they were commended for. That's what Abraham sought for, to have that land that, 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 that and no one or to have that nation that, of, of people that no man can number. Amen? Abraham sought for that. Did he see it in his lifetime? No, he did not. No, he did not. Did his children see it in their lifetime? No, they did not. No, they did not. In fact, many of the children or great-grandchildren or great-great-grandchildren even grew up as slaves. So now, you have this vision or this dream or this guarantee from God that you be the father of many nations, but yet it doesn't happen in your lifetime, your kids' lifetimes, or even your children's children's lifetimes. So why would they continue to pursue the promise that God gave them? Because they understood they were part of his story. Amen? Amen? Now, when we look at Hebrews 11, 1 and 2, I've said this before in the past, it is a proven example of the fact that you and I are mentioned in the Bible. You say, well, how are we mentioned in the Bible? Let's go back to Hebrews 11. It says, now faith is the confidence in what we, you, me, anybody who considers himself to be a Christian, hope for, and assurance about what we, you, me, and anybody else who considers themselves a Christian, do not see. So therefore, if we is an inclusive plural pronoun, that, that takes you and to me into account. So therefore, you and I are mentioned in the Bible. Amen? So that also says that you and I both have a role to play in this awesome cinematic production. So what role do you have to play? We talked about this a few weeks ago. You all have gifts that I need. I have a gift that you need. Pastor has a gift that you need. Pastor has a gift that I need, right? We, in the body of Christ, grow together like a plant that grows together. All of the components of a plant all benefit each other. And as that plant grows, that plant produces fruit. Now, the fruit is not to be taken in by the people or the, the, the plant in and of itself, right? The fruit is to be partaken of by those outside of it. So therefore, it is imperative for us to have good fruit. And that fruit is the love, joy, peace, so on and so forth, right? But if our tree or if our root is damaged because of the fact that I don't want to share my gift with you or you don't want to share your gift with me, we're going to have bad fruit. 
that's not a part of his story that we want to be a part of. We want to be a part of the good part of his story, which means that we will sow the good fruit by us sharing our gifts with each other. Amen? So God wants you and I to draw others to him by us having the good fruit. He wants us to draw each other to him by us sharing our gifts. Amen? We exist to give him pleasure. We don't exist to give each other pleasure. We do enjoy being pleased by saying thank you or or having gifts given to us. My wife and I was blessed the other night to go on a dinner. But our joy comes from the Lord. Our strength comes from the Lord. Amen? Amen? And God rewards those who fulfill his desires. Fulfill his desires. My wife mentioned earlier that we had a conversation with someone and uh, he questioned whether or not the Bible was real. Questioned whether or not the Bible was real. And I know many of us have gone down that road. I've been down that road. I mean, if you haven't been down that road, you're not a Christian. Just, just be honest, right? We all question things that happen in the Bible. And if you don't question things that are in the Bible, as one teacher said, it's foolish. You need to try it. You need to test it, right? But the one thing that I found to be true is that that every single prophecy in the Bible has come true. Every single one has either come true or will come true. It's the only book throughout all of history that has not had a single prophecy not be fulfilled. You can't say that about any other book in the world. And this Bible was written by hundreds of people. There's thousands of people that it talks about, but yet it's the one book that spans several centuries that had hundreds and thousands of prophecies, and they've all have come true or will come true. So now, remember those plants that I talked about earlier? The plants that my wife wanted to grow that was looking so beautiful, and I transplanted them into another pot and essentially killed them, right? Well, once we started to water those plants and place them in the sunlight, what do you think happened? Those plants started to grow again. Did all of them grow again? No, they didn't. All the plants didn't grow. In fact, only a few of them started to grow. What did that mean? Some of them, some of them didn't have a strong enough rooted system. So when they got transplanted from one area, ooh, thank you, Lord. When they got transplanted from one area to another area so that it can be more prosperous, they couldn't handle it. Many of us in our lives are so complacent with where we are. We enjoy the fruit that we enjoy right now or or the the benefits that we receive right now. And when God says move, we're, we're, we're hesitant. In fact, we're very resistant to the fact that God says move. And so because of the fact that we're resistant to when God says move, when he forces up us up out of that soil that we were in before into a soil that's much more prosperous, we can't handle it. Now, so what God does is that he says, listen, I'm not going to let you fail. I'm still going to provide to you the things that you need, the love that you need from your brother and your sister, right? Because you still need to have that because maybe you're your baby, maybe you're a baby. Or if you're more advanced, I'm going to give you someone that has the ability to prophesy in your life, the ability that has healing in your life, to share their gifts with you. Because maybe it is that gift that, you, that someone else needs or has for you that can help you grow. So when we get transplanted into a bigger area, like I said, the plants that I gave my wife, or the, the pot that I gave my wife, is about three times bigger than what it was before. In fact, I went out and bought another one, which is four or five times bigger than what it was before. So now when she plants something, there's no question about whether or not it's going to be able to make it. That's what God does with us in our lives. He moves us out of a comfortable situation and transfers us into an area, into an environment to where we have no choice but to grow. But this is the other thing. So those plants that didn't make it, they weren't strong enough. The flaws that I have that's not worthy to receive the blessing that he has, those things be able to go away. The things that we want to hold on to in our lives are the things that we really do need to let go. And when God places an environment, 
that we don't have a choice but to let it go, it's hard, but guess what? That plant is gonna be the best plant that it can ever be. The fruit from that plant is gonna be so awesome, and my wife and I are gonna be able to cherish it because it survived. It survived. So like you and I, when we get transplanted from one area to another area, are you gonna be able to say that you survived? Are you going to be able to withstand the test of being transplanted, having some of your roots torn away from you so that you can receive the blessing that God has for you? Because he's going to make sure that you succeed, but it's up to you to walk in that blessing. It's up to you to accept the blessing. It's up to you to not hold on or hold or hoard everything that's been given to you, but to sow it to others so that they can continue to grow. We say here we're blessed to be a blessing, and that's the honest truth. You are blessed to be a blessing. There is no one in here who has been guaranteed to receive everything and hold it on to themselves. You will not grow. You cannot hold on to the promise that God gave to you and not communicate that to anybody. You cannot hold on to the gift that God gave to you and not share that with anybody. It's impossible for you to grow and you're hindering someone else's growth. Amen? So we have two commandments. And this is amazing. In the Old Testament, love God or fear God and keep his commandments. And in the New Testament, love God and fear God and keep his commandments. Treat others well. Treat others well. So the challenge that we have today is how do I get out of myself to give more to someone else? We could be like that plant that was transplanted from one pot to another pot and be so damaged emotionally, spiritually, physically that we want to just falter and just die. Or we can shake that stuff off, understand that, you know what, I'm in a better surrounding and thank God for the blessing that he has for us. Amen? Amen. Last fact, last fact, and hopefully this is encouraging somebody today, man. Amen. Many Christians are viewed to be weak. We are viewed to be weak because of the fact that we are the first ones to step aside and quote unquote get run over. If you show me anywhere in the Bible where Jesus was weak, please let me know. Because in Jesus' quote-unquote weakness, that's where he showed strength. When he was getting spat on, he showed strength. Incredible restraint. Because I guarantee you, if I spit on anybody in here, somebody want to rise up in a heartbeat. Even though I love all you guys, y'all love me, but I'm spitting on you. That, that don't feel too good. He was whipped. He was abused. In the same night that he was to be crucified, he was also betrayed by his best friend. Now that right there, let my husband, let my wife, let my sister, let my brother, let my best friend do something wrong against me, that's an unforgivable sin for many of us. But you show me where Jesus did not go back to Peter and bring him to him. He did that. Because you can't show me where he did not do that. He did that. In fact, he didn't even bring it up. He took a negative situation and made it a positive. He said, Peter, if you love me. He didn't say, oh, I saw what you did, so therefore I don't think you do. He said, if you love me, feed my sheep. If you love me, keep my commandments. And then he made one of the boldest statements ever. Upon this rock, I'll build my church, and the gates of hell shall not prevail. Let's pray, and I pray that you and I are becoming that rock. Not just for our own sake, but for his sake, because we are part of his story. Amen? Amen. Let's go before God in prayer. Dear Heavenly Father, we thank you for the life, health, and strength that you've given us today. Thank you for giving us a word to show us how we are part of your story. Our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ's story, Lord. 
And we thank you, Lord, for the blessing that you've bestowed upon us. We thank you for the life, health, and strength that you've given us, Lord. And we thank you for the desire and the Holy Spirit to come into our lives to show us how we can be an example, a disciple of his word. God, if there's anybody here today that wants to accept you as the Lord and Savior of their lives, who believes that you died and rose again, Lord, we welcome you, Lord. We welcome them, Lord, into our fold. And God, we ask that you accept them as a personal sacrifice and commitment to you, Lord. And God, we thank you for those bodies that, that, that have said that they wanted to do so, Lord. And God, continue to give us the tools and the abilities, the teachings, the prophetic prophecies, the, the, the healing, uh, anything that's, that, that your fruit and your gifts, God, we accept it. We accept it, Lord. In Jesus' name, amen and amen.